This episode of Watch for Watchings has been brought to you by this amazing art piece done by Fluff Dragon Art. And if you're thinking, wow, this looks awesome for the Halloween season, well, you're in luck because it is on sale. There'll be a link in the description down below to my Streamlabs merchandise page where you can get it for yourself. But hurry up, this will only be available until November 1st. Now that that's out of the way, on with the show. Well, it's Halloween time. And as a horror fan, it's probably my second favorite time of the year behind Christmas. I say that because even Christmas is becoming a second Halloween thanks to all the horror movies that are being made about it. But Halloween was here first as far as I'm concerned. But as a reviewer, that raises the ultimate question, what am I going to do for the holidays? Well, last year I did a review of Trick or Treat, which is a horror anthology series. So I think it's only fair we go to what is arguably considered the best horror anthology ever created. With an amazing pedigree of writing from Stephen King and directing from George A. Romero himself. And if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm of course talking about Creepshow. Yes, Creepshow, the 80s horror anthology series. Arguably the one that started the craze of horror anthology in the first place. And it was also meant to be an homage to the old EC horror comics of the 50s. You know, stuff like The Vault of Horror, The Haunt of Fear, Tales of Suspense, and yes, Tales from the Crypt. However, instead of just adapting stories from something like Tales from the Crypt, they instead took this opportunity to mimic the style of the comics itself. Mimicking the camera angles, the look, the lighting, the style, everything down to a T. And just from the names attached to this alone, you can tell that they were really committed to doing that. I already mentioned Stephen King famous for being, well, Stephen King. Probably one of the greatest horror writers of this generation. Stephen King did write some amazing horror stories, so why not have him write the script? And of course, George A. Romero, also known for being George A. Romero, aka the man who made the Dead series, was also kind of a no-brainer. And the effects were done by the amazing Tom Savini himself. Yet another name, if you know anything about horror, needs no introduction. So we have a trifecta of an amazing special effects artist, an amazing writer, and an amazing director, all from the horror genre, all working together to pay tribute to stuff like Tales from the Crypt. I know this sounds like a setup for what could possibly go wrong, but actually, nothing did go wrong. To jump the gun a bit, Creepshow is still remembered as one of the greatest horror movies ever made. But why is that exactly? Well, let's take a look. Oh, I'm sorry, judging by that jack-o'-lantern, I seemed to have put in Halloween by accident. No, this actually is Creepshow, and we actually open on a father berating his kid for reading a horror comic. And he decides to throw the comic away. Oh, well, at least the Silver Shamrock Mass will have something to read now. And yeah, if that reference wasn't an indication, I wasn't joking about the Halloween comparison earlier. Because that is Tom Atkins from Halloween 3 playing the father. Bit of an odd choice, but hey, he's a good horror actor, so I'll let it pass. But yeah, if it hasn't been made obvious yet, this is the wraparound for the movie. Rather than the Creepshow segments sharing a contained universe that all happens in the same area, they're all individually contained stories, with this story beginning and ending it. In a similar fashion to the house raid in the first two VHS movies. And before anyone asks, sure, I'll think about reviewing those someday. But yeah, there's not much else to actually say about this wraparound as, well, it's a wraparound. I will say, rather unintentional or not, I think this is nice commentary on moral outrage. But specifically the moral outrage about horror comics back in the 50s. Yeah, about that. You ever notice how horror comics have only recently started to get a comeback? Yeah, there's kind of a reason for that, as there was actually a moral outrage about horror comics back in the 1950s. Saying stuff like they were gory, graphic, promoted violence, and were bad influence on children who were the primary buyers of it. It got so bad that William Gaines, the creator of EC Comics, had to actually testify in court that his comics were not a bad influence on people. And it also led to the creation of the Comics Code Authority, which basically made so much strict guidelines when it came to comic books that EC couldn't make their horror comics anymore, essentially killing horror comics for decades. But thankfully, horror comics do seem to be coming back in quite a big way. And thankfully, we never had Think of the Children moral outrage ever again. Well, except for when horror movies became super popular. And then there was video games. Oh, and we can't forget the D&D panic. And then there was video games again. Okay, okay, we're getting off topic. Point is, the wraparound reaches us to our movie proper with this creepy motherfucker. That's the titular mascot of the Creepshow franchise, The Creep. And it looks like he brought his EC style comics animated intro. Neat. And it's at this point we get to the segments proper. Thankfully, unlike Trick or Treat, they don't have an interconnecting story so that I can actually tackle these one at a time. First up is Father's Day. Well, finally, a Father's Day horror movie. All the other holidays get one, why shouldn't Father's Day? What? There is a Father's Day horror movie? Jeez, they won't make a movie about anything nowadays. But anyway, the movie opens up with a bunch of rich wasps. And they're waiting for their Aunt Bedelia, who apparently murdered someone on this day. And don't blame me for spoiling that, they're pretty open about it. I'd say they should probably keep it on the down low, but they're probably so rich, what does it matter? Okay, to be fair, I think we all know exactly why they're meant to be so unlikable. 
When I said this took a lot of influence from old EC horror comics, I meant that in the tropes as well. Let's be honest, you're not gonna feel bad when these guys kick the bucket. And that was the whole point of those kinds of comics, bad people getting their comeuppance. Hell, so much so that I want an actual wasp to fly through here and sting them. Of course, then it would turn into stung, which actually wouldn't be a bad thing either. But let's stick with Creepshow as we see Aunt Bedelia and we see exactly how she killed her father. And we quickly see another great aspect from this. These transitions and cards. I mean, just look at this. It's literally a comic incarnate. Which, yeah, I know. No, duh. It's based off EC Comics, so of course it's gonna do that. But did it have to, though? I mean, let's be honest, there's plenty of comic book movies that don't actually use comic paneling. Or comic style shooting for that matter, not even the Marvel movies for the most part. And instead of coming off as goofy, it adds a level of charm to it. But what's even more surprising is that this segment's surprisingly less gory than most of the EC comics. In fact, most of the movie is. For the most part, but we'll get to that segment. Anyway, Ampedelia goes to the gravestone, and thanks to a little Jim Bean cocktail, guess who's back? I mean, let's be honest, I'd probably do that too if someone poured Jim Bean on my grave. But I wouldn't drink it, I'd haunt your ass. But yes, the father's back, and from here on out, it's a standard zombie slasher flick. That's not a knock against the segment for the record, it's still pretty good. It's just a little more generic compared to the other ones. He just goes after pretty much everyone in the house. Gotcha, bitch! So yeah, it's a pretty standard slasher flick, essentially, with a zombie. It's serviceable, but what makes up for it is the execution. Like the aforementioned comic panels, as well as the acting. And especially the effects. But I mean, come on, it's Tom Sabini. Get used to me saying that a lot in this review. I mean, just look at all the crazy detail that went into this rotted corpse. For this segment not being super graphic or gory, it's pretty disturbing. And it's not relying on being bloody or mangled or anything like that. Or at least not as much compared to the other movies around the 80s. Also, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the wimpiest horror cry in all of history. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. What kind of death cry is that? I mean, just imagine that cry over other horror movies. In fact... <laughs> yep, instantly makes them hilarious. But yeah, that aside, this is still a pretty alright segment overall. A serviceable, if below average story, brought up immensely thanks to some amazing direction and effects. The next segment is probably my second favorite, The Lonesome Death of Jody Verrill. This one's about a redneck hick farmer who finds a meteor in his backyard after it crashes. Hey look, it's Ed's hick cousin. Okay, I swear that's my only redneck joke, nothing more after that. And if the title character looks familiar, well that's because it's Stephen King himself. No joke, that is actually Stephen King playing a hick farmer. And I know so many people might be crying foul considering he's a writer, not an actor. But here's something that's gonna actually really shock you. He's actually pretty good. Now I have no idea if this is George A. Romero's directing in work, or if Stephen King just has a secret talent for acting. But either way, I give him props because he's really trying and he's pretty good. Not only that, but throughout most of this segment, he's playing this solo. Oh sure, he's sharing the screen with other actors in small moments, but they're pretty few and far between. I mean sure, he's goofy and over the top, but hey, so were the comics, so I'm pretty sure that was the point. It's one man coming to his inevitable doom. Which is pretty ironic since he's the one character you kinda don't wanna die. He's actually probably the most likable character in this whole movie. Which I suppose would be my one real complaint with the segment is that I wish he actually kind of was unlikable. At least then his eventual demise would be a lot less tragic. But then again, that's what the segment is going for. So I admit this is personal taste and not a problem with the segment itself. Plus at least his demise is creative. And no, I don't mean the shotgun to the head. I mean all the plants just encroaching all around and turning him into Swamp Thing. I'm kind of impressed at all the shrubbery that's growing around here. And I mean from an effects standpoint, not a story standpoint. I mean just look at this, especially the Jordy Verrill giant moss suit. It's honestly pretty cool looking, but I wouldn't try to market it. I'm pretty sure Chia Monster isn't going to catch on. But yeah, this one's actually pretty on the simple side, so I don't have much to say. So yeah, my final thoughts, King's pretty good as an actor, and this is actually a pretty good story. Oh, and also this one probably has my favorite camera angles out of all the segments. I mean, just look at these, freeze frame any of these and you can totally make a comic about it. I say laughing to myself as most of these angles aren't even used in the comic. But yeah, second favorite segment, pretty damn good, let's move on. Next we get to my personal favorite segment, something to tide you over. Even if you've never seen Creepshow, this is probably the one most people remember from it. And it's honestly for one very simple reason, Leslie Nielsen. Yep, I shit you not, Leslie Nielsen plays the bad guy in this segment. Now I know some of you are probably saying, Leslie Nielsen playing a bad guy, that impossible. 
But actually, this was before Airplane, and back then, before he became the comedy man, he actually mostly played bad guys. And there's a reason for that. He's great in this segment. Seriously, the rest of the segment is still great, but adding Leslie Nielsen to this is like adding a cherry on top of a chocolate sundae. It's an add-on that's not even needed, but somehow instantly makes it even better. He's a cold, ruthless son of a bitch. I mean, he buries the boyfriend out to his neck in sand. Oh yeah, and the boyfriend's also Ted Danson, by the way. I kinda didn't mention that because while he's not bad, he's kind of overshadowed by Leslie. He's just running circles around Ted Danson, if I'm being totally honest. But Ted still does a good job. He is sympathetic enough that you do feel legitimately bad for him. Meanwhile, Leslie, you love and also love to hate him at the same time. Not to mention, he is still a comedy actor, so he is very funny. And also, this is the segment I wanted to point it out since I feel it's the best one to use these. But oh my god, these comic panels and that lighting. I mean, these superimposed comic panels look so stylish, especially with the camera angle. And this lighting with all the blue and red gels, it's gorgeous. Yet more proof that this is literally a living comic brought to movie form. I suppose if I did have one complaint, it would be the monsters. I mean, I'll give him credit for the design. I mean, Ocean Zombies is kind of something I haven't seen before. But that's kind of the thing. They're just zombies. Nothing special about them. And actually, this is the second segment to use zombies. You know, call it a hunch, but I think the director has a thing for zombies. Like I said, it's just a hunch though. But yeah, that's a very, 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 very minor complaint. This is still one of my favorite segments for a reason. 10 out of 10, would watch Leslie ham it up again. Next up is The Crate. Another good one, actually. This one is about a professor with a very naggy wife. And of course, the titular crate itself from an Arctic expedition. I'm thinking John Carpenter sends his regards. No, I'm not even joking. The crate says Carpenter. That's a nice little shout out. But yeah, we officially meet the creature of this feature. And apparently the staff nicknamed it Fluffy. Why is that? Well, see for yourself. Look out, it's Chewbacca's pissed off cousin. Okay, actually, the creature effect looks really freaking good. This might actually be one of my favorite Yeti designs in any movie. And yes, that's basically what it is. It's a Yeti. And it starts going on a killing spree. And admittedly, besides the last segment, this is probably the goriest the movie ever gets. I mean, there is just buckets and buckets of blood and limbs getting torn off. This is actually the one that feels most like a violent comic. And you know what, that might be intentional. I feel like each segment pays tribute to certain aspects of certain comics. Father's Day pays tributes to rich pricks dying. The Lonesome Death tells us sometimes even the innocent can die. Something to tide you over. Well, it's got Lizzie Nielsen, so whatever. And this one, well, it's all about the gore, gore, gore. And that's not a knock because Tom Savini gore is always going to be a win. And damn it, John Romero, stop having such gorgeous shots with your red gel lights. I'm actually getting jealous I can't make shots this good. Show me some more drunken housewife to cheer me up. You know, I would complain about her drunken shenanigans, but she's no different than how I act on my drunk streams. Which you should totally be watching, by the way. If I'm gonna damage my liver, you fuckers better be watching it. But anyway, the professor uses this opportunity to kill his wife by using the crate. <laughs> Chewbacca didn't fuck around in his youth. Well, the crate is gone. I mean, there's a crap ton of evidence that's left behind, and I'm pretty sure they're gonna question you since you'd be the sole suspect. But I'm pretty sure they're not gonna take Fluffy's testimony, so you're in the clear. So, happily ever after, question mark? And finally, we have the last segment of the entire episode. They're creeping up on you. Okay, actually two things before I continue. I just noticed each segment gets a comic style intro because it's supposed to be a comic book framing device. But holy crap, I cannot read half of these it goes by so fast. I don't know whether to be mad because I have to pause the video to actually read these, or should I be impressed that they went through that much attention to detail? Impress? Annoyed? Employed? Yeah, employed. That works. And also, I'm just gonna say this right now, if you are even remotely squeamish when it comes to bugs, specifically cockroaches, you might want to watch this between the fingers on your hands. Or you can go out to the comment section, it's usually pretty safe there. Unless there's another flame war going on, in which case, hey, behave down there, we have people hiding, damn it. Okay, anyway, let's move on. This episode features Ups and Pratt, living in an uptown apartment that kinda looks like if the cast of Blade Runner were germaphobes. By the way, if he looks familiar, that's because he's played by legendary character actor E.G. Daly. Yes, that E.G. Daly from 12 Angry Men and Christmas Vacation. And apparently he looks like the baby if Grumpy the Dwarf had sex with the Three Stooges. And he's also a germaphobe, as the name suggests, as he finds cockroaches in his apartment. Which I'm kind of amazed by considering it costs him 32000 a month just to have this place. Don't feel too bad for him spending that much money a month though, he is supposed to be the antagonist of this segment. Speaking of which, I think it's time for our creature of the night to appear, have some cockroaches. 
Buckets, tons, gallons, just, just all of them. Just all the cockroaches ever. Don't say I didn't warn you guys. Hey, at least it's cathartic to get some nice cockroach smashing in. And one of the benefits of using real ones is that you can smush them all you want and no one will care. No, I'm not joking. Those are actual cockroaches in this scene. I've heard rumors that some of them were puppets, but most if not all of them were actual cockroaches. And keep in mind, this was made in the 1980s. They could not fake this with CGI. And yes, they are getting mushed and smushed. But let's be honest, if you were in his situation, you would do the exact same thing. And if you say you wouldn't, then you're a liar. Luckily, Pratt has a panic room. But wait a minute, what's under the bed? I've literally got nothing. This scene just makes me uncomfortable. But this movie isn't over yet. Yeah, I wasn't joking when I said this was gonna get really gross. So, super gross thing you can and see in 3, 2, 1. That's nasty. You can't say I didn't warn you, but don't worry because that's the end of it. Oh, but first we gotta finish the wraparound segment. Complete with one last cameo from the special effects artist himself, Tom Savini. Anyway, the movie actually ends with little Billy getting his revenge on his dad using the voodoo doll. That's a good life lesson for the kitties. Kill your parents if they steal your comics. Oh, who am I kidding? Kids aren't watching this. At least I hope not. But in any case, that was Creepshow, and it's not hard to see why this is one of my favorite horror movies ever. Everything about this movie is just a delight. From the amazing comic style visuals and camera work, to the great effects, to the great acting. And I'm not the only one who thinks so, as this is already considered a classic by horror fans everywhere. Hell, even at the time, it was a hit with both critics and the box office when it was released. Even though some critics didn't really get it was meant to be a tongue-in-cheek tribute to comics. Which I find really stupid considering it makes that apparent from the start. And I mean the actual poster. The tagline is the most fun you'll ever have being scared and that's very true. Even though it still has an R-rated edginess to it, it's not meant to be super edgy, gory, or dark. It's just a nice, fun little movie. With all the tropes you'd expect from the old EC comics. Abrupt, dark twist endings, unlikable characters, sixth sense of humor, gore. It's obvious that it's not only meant to be a tribute to the comics, but it doesn't take itself remotely seriously, and that's kind of why it's so great. It doesn't need to be taken seriously, it already knows it's great. In fact, I'd argue this is a better tribute to Tales from the Crypt than the actual TV show. Sure, it's not especially scary, but as far as just sheer fun in a horror movie, then I can think of nothing better than Creepshow. It's the most fun you'll ever have being dead, and honestly, I welcome it. But again, thanks for watching everyone, and a big thank you to Fluff Dragon for creating this amazing piece of art. If you want this piece of art, it is available on Streamlabs. But you gotta hurry, it's only gonna be here until midnight of November 1st. So by the time this video comes up, you'll have less than a week to get it, so go hurry. Of course, if you want to support me more long term, I do have a Patreon, where you can do stuff like request me reviews or take part in monthly raffles to decide what I do review for that month. As well as exclusive Discord access and all that good stuff. But that's all I gotta say, so see you later and happy Halloween everyone!